Prairie Ecology event. My name is Dakota Stock. I am working as an AmeriCorps, serving as an AmeriCorps member with Conservation Nebraska. If this is your first webinar with us, I'll talk a little bit through Conservation Nebraska, what, what we do while we wait for everybody to get on and sign in and get comfy. So Conservation Nebraska is a nonprofit organization that does educational environmental events all throughout the state. We have different regions and each region kind of goes into their different towns and cities and understands what um, environmental issues kind of really set in and what people care about. We try to focus on that and create events and webinars like this that uh, mean something to the people. So what we say is meet people where they are. <laughs> so um, yes, I'm so excited to be here with Chris Helzer and hear what he has to teach us about the prairie, the beautiful prairie that surrounds us in Nebraska. Um, he has been with the Nature Conservancy for 23 plus years, right? Is that right, Chris? Yep. Awesome. Um, and he also has been doing photography for 26 plus years. So this is definitely his thing and um, he is an expert in it. So I'm excited to learn with all of you. Looks like we've got quite a few people in here. Thank you guys for taking out time in your Saturday afternoon to be here with us and learn and educate yourself. We are so lucky that you're here. All right, Chris, I'm gonna hit, oh, sorry. I'm gonna say one more thing. Just so you know, you are muted and we cannot see you. So don't worry about any of that. Um, we are going to have a Q&A at the end of his talk. So if you would like to post any questions into the Q&A section, during his talk or after, whenever you want, or whenever they pop into your head, feel free to put those in there. And this will be recorded and posted on both Conservation Nebraska's website, as well as the Facebook page that this was on. So that will be available. All right, Chris, start whenever you are ready. Okay. Yeah, thanks everybody. Uh, I also appreciate you joining us on a hot Saturday. Um, I guess it's probably nicer than being outdoors right now. I am going to talk today about prairies, which is something near and dear to me. Um, I do a lot of talking about prairies to people because I think um, outside of the conservation community, and I'm, out, I'm sure outside of this group, uh, you know, people tend to see prairies as these kind of flat, boring areas of grass. Uh, and if people don't care about them, they're not going to do anything to help save them. So. Uh, a lot of what I talk about today is going to be uh, trying to get you interested in prairies, but I'm also going to do some science. Uh, I'll jump into a classroom mode for a little bit, but I promise to bookend that with a lot of photography at the beginning and end. So I want to start with sunflowers. And I want to start with sunflowers because it's a good example of the kind of complexity and diversity that is in prairies and a lot of other natural systems too. But in Nebraska, there are nine different species of sunflower. Two of those are annuals. The others are perennials that can live essentially forever unless they get dug up or uh, you know, overgrazed or something bad happens to them. They can keep putting up new shoots every year for as many years as they need to. Um, in addition to those nine species, there are a lot of other species that look like sunflowers and provide a lot of the same resources and services that sunflowers provide. And some of those include uh, pollen and nectar. And sunflowers are great because they give their pollen and nectar away for free. You know, they really just literally put it on a platter for any kind of insect or other creature to come get. Um, as opposed to things like a pea flower or bean flower that, you know, a lot of times are a closed flower. An insect has to figure out how to get itself in there or it has to have a long tongue to get the nectar out. Sunflowers just give it out. And this is a longhorn bee, and this particular species of bee is a specialist on sunflowers. So it has to have a sunflower of some kind in order to get the pollen that it needs to, to feed itself and its babies. But there are a lot of other insects besides just pollinators um, that take advantage of that resource. So this tree, tree cricket is one, but a lot of grasshoppers and beetles and other insects will feed on that pollen because it's really nutritious food for lots of different creatures. And then because there are a lot of creatures that are attracted to sunflowers. There are a lot of predators. Um, 
So back to this one for a second, you know, this is a cool crab spider that is an ambush predator that sits on flowers and waits for something to come by. Uh, this the cucumber beetle that's in its grasp right there was feeding on pollen and it got too close to the crab spider and now the crab spider gets launched too. And this is an ambush bug that is very similar in that it's an ambush predator, or not ambush bug, I'm sorry, assassin bug. Um, and it's got its long proboscis inside a little, uh, little fly right there. And then another thing that sunflowers do, which is kind of interesting, they produce extra floral nectar, meaning that they, they make a sweet substance that comes out of other parts of the plant, not just out of the front of the flower, uh, where you think about nectar most of the time. And ants, as it turns out, have a sweet tooth, and they're attracted to the extra floral nectar. And so if you look at those little shiny droplets on the back of the sunflower head, that's some extra floral nectar that that sunflower produces, probably in part because that attracts ants. And if you think about it, ants are major predators, especially in groups. And so the sunflower is kind of buying protection by attracting a bunch of little predators to swarm around on this flower and hopefully keep itself from being eaten by too many other insects. And then, of course, because ants are attracted to the flowers, there are predators that are waiting for them also. Uh, and then if you've got a bird feeder, it's a good chance that you use sunflower seeds as your bird feed, as at least as part of your bird food. And the reason for that is the sunflower seeds are also very nutritious. So uh, quail, but lots and lots of other bird species and other wildlife species rely on seeds from sunflowers as part of their diet. And then even grazers, um, large and small, so this bison calf, but even things down to grasshoppers, feed a lot on the, on the leaves, the young flowers, the buds, uh, other parts besides just the pollen and the seed. So all of the sunflower is used by something. And because we have nine different kinds of sunflowers, they respond in different ways. Uh, and this is something that'll be kind of a theme of the talk. Uh, when something happens, there's always a sunflower that can respond to it. So this is a photo that was taken in the sand hills in the summer of 2012. So if you remember, 2012 was an extreme drought year and there was a wildfire in the sand hills. This is on the Nature Conservancy's Niobrara Valley Preserve, one of the places that I get to work. Um, and it was a 70 some thousand acre fire in the middle of the summer, uh, in the middle of a drought. And it looked pretty bleak afterwards, but prairies respond well to this kind of disturbance. We weren't too worried about it. But one of the species that really responded very strongly the next year were annual sunflowers. So the plains sunflower, one of the two annuals that we have basically blanketed a lot of the sunflowers in 2013, partly because a lot of the other plants were suffering uh, stress from the drought year. And then if you compound that with a summer fire and really stress out all the other plants, the sunflowers were able to take uh, the place of a lot of other resources that weren't being provided. And so they filled in as needed, basically. And we can see the same kind of reaction when we do a our own fire and grazing treatments in the sand hills. So here's a, a patch of sand hills that was burned in the spring by us on purpose and controlled fire. And then bison have been grazing it all season and they're keeping the grass really, really short. They're letting some of the wildflowers grow, but the grass is really short. And that opens up a lot of space for new plants to come in, including things like annual sunflowers. So when a lot of other plants aren't doing well, sunflowers can sort of fill in and provide all the resources that they do. Um, and that is part of the complexity and the resilience of prairies, which is, again, something I'm going to talk about quite a bit here. So it's nice that there are more than one kind of sunflower, or there is more than one kind of sunflower. Um, and again, some are perennials that long, live a long time. Some are annuals that can respond very quickly to, to a disturbance. We talked about the annuals, but if you look at the perennials, one of the great things about Nebraska is that Anywhere you go, regardless of what kind of habitat there is, there's likely to be a sunflower growing there of some kind, which means that those species that need sunflowers or that rely on them as an important resource can probably find a sunflower no matter where they are. If you're at the top of the hill on a dry slope, you might find stiff sunflower. Um, if you're down in a lower slope or in a little wetter area with maybe a little shade, you might find Jerusalem artichoke, which is another perennial native sunflower. So wetter, drier, sunnier, shady, there's going to be a sunflower for you somewhere. And again, that's an important part of why complexity and diversity in prairies is important because those resources are everywhere. And as we see the climate continue to change, we'll probably see these species shift around a little bit in terms of where they are, 
but no matter what the climate does to a particular habitat type, there probably will be a sunflower that's adapted for that situation. It'll still be around. Okay, let's switch gears and talk milkweed a little bit. So milkweed is really similar to sunflowers in, in that there's a wide diversity of species. In fact, in Nebraska, there's almost twice as many uh, species of milkweed as we have sunflowers. So we have nine sunflowers, 17 milkweed species. And that includes a lot of milkweed that is not sort of the, the big pink ones that, that you might be familiar with. Uh, they come in a lot of different shapes and colors. And that's important uh, for a lot of the same reasons we talked about. And I'll give you an example in a minute. But, you know, milkweed are, are really important for a lot of different kinds of pollinators, including bumblebees and regal fritillary butterflies, like this one, which is a prairie specialist butterfly. Um, tiny little things like bee flies that have a stiff little proboscis that they feed with. Um, even things like wasps. And you'll notice that not all of the milkweed flowers in these photos are pink, right? So there are a lot of different species, all of which are important in different ways for different kinds of pollinators. Um, and just like with sunflowers, because they're, those flowers are attractive to uh, a lot of different pollinators, you also get uh, insects that are predators that are going to be sitting there waiting for something to come. So here's another assassin bug and here's another crab spider, both of them on milkweed that are taking advantage of the popularity of milkweed with lots of other insects. And the milkweed is a little special because it has this, if you've ever popped the leaf off of a milkweed or broken the stem, you see the white latex that comes out of it, which is a sticky toxic substance produced by milkweed. It's actually not the sap, it's a separate vascular system of, of of latex that is created by the plant and it's a protective measure. So it tastes bad, it's toxic to most creatures. So it, it dissuades uh, animals for the most part from eating the leaves and the stems of the milkweed, which is a, a nice strategy to have. But there are some insect species that specialize on milkweed and have, have one way or another adapted themselves to that toxic food. So that includes things like the longhorn milkweed beetle shown here, or the big, the large milkweed bug, which feeds on all, the, all parts of the milkweed, but especially on the seeds of the milkweed plant. Um, there are things like the oleander aphids, which is a non-native species, but also is a, on just about any kind of milkweed you can find. And then of course, most people are familiar with monarch butterflies, which require uh, milkweed for their larvae to feed on. Uh, they lay eggs on the milkweed and then the, that raises their kids for them. And really any kind of milkweed will do. They, monarchs have favorites, but they can take advantage of just about whatever milkweed species is out there. And that turns out to be really helpful in some situations. And one example is just a couple of years ago. Typically, monarch butterflies have a four generation pattern to them, right? So there's, there's four different generations and one of them is migratory. And in the fall, the migratory population leaves Nebraska goes all the way down to Mexico, overwinters in Mexico, and then in the spring, the same individuals make their way back into the southern part of the US, and they lay eggs in places like Arkansas and Alabama and Texas, Oklahoma. And then when those eggs hatch, the next generation is the one that we, we see in Nebraska, and it usually shows up in June. Well, a couple of years ago, um, and sometimes in May, but a couple of years ago, they, they were early. And for whatever reason, we had monarchs coming straight from Mexico all the way up into Nebraska, which was neat because we got to see them earlier in the year. Uh, and you can tell by the look of this one, uh, that was one of those butterflies. It's had a long life and a rough life. It's faded, the wings are torn up. It's made of, you know, two really long trips. Uh, the problem was by, by showing up early, its favorite food source, common milkweed and maybe showy milkweed, really hadn't had time to grow yet. And the few that had grown in warmer sites had gotten knocked back by a freeze that had just happened. So they really weren't available. So there, so there was no common milkweed or showy milkweed for those monarchs to lay eggs on. And they had a very limited time because they were about dead and they needed to lay eggs quick before they died. Uh, and fortunately, we have a lot of different kinds of milkweed and they grow on different schedules. So this is world milkweed, which is a smaller, finer leaved milkweed with white flowers. And it is apparently a lot more resistant to frost and freezes because it was still growing strong after those cold temperatures. And so as a result, world milkweed carried the day for monarchs that year. And the first generation that we saw in Nebraska 
come out of eggs and, and larvae were grown on these, these skinny little leaved uh, boral milkweed, which normally doesn't get a lot of attention from anybody, let alone monarchs. Um, but the monarchs grew really well on them. They became adults. And that's how you know, monarchs basically survived what was a crazy weird year in terms of their migratory system. So again, having a diversity of species builds resilience, builds redundancy into the system. And that's a really important thing. And that's just one example of how that works. So the last example before we switch into some more classroom stuff is about pollinators, because everybody wants to know about pollinators this, these days, which is great. Um, unfortunately, when you talk about bees, most people think about this photo, which is a honeybee. And that's a shame because honeybees are a tiny little piece of the story. And they're one of the least uh, at risk species that we have. If you want to save pollinators, don't become a beekeeper uh, because bees have keepers, right? Bees are livestock species, basically. Honeybees are European transports or imports that we brought in with us when, when we as Europeans, uh, speaking for myself at least, came to the US. Um, we brought honeybees as a, as a way to help our agricultural systems. They weren't here before uh, and they are dealing with some pests and pathogens and things like that. But if a colony of honeybees dies out, they have humans to go get another queen and start another colony. So the species is at no risk. Um, what's more at risk are the native bees that we have, things like bumblebees. And in Nebraska, we have 20 different kinds of bumblebees. So you can't just say bumblebee. You have to think about all the different kinds of bumblebees there might be. And even beyond that, there's way more diversity of bee species in Nebraska, we don't even know because we don't have good inventory numbers, but there's at least four to 500 different species of bees in Nebraska that are native, that, are, that have been here, that are important to the wildflowers and natural systems that we have. And nationwide or continent-wide, there's at least 5,000 species of bees. So that's an incredible diversity. And they come in all shapes and sizes and colors. They have different patterns of behavior. Most of them are not colonial. So most of them don't have a queen and worker system like you think about with honeybees or even bumblebees. Most of them are a single female raising a brood of kids, um, usually in a hole in the ground like this one, or sometimes in a hollow stem. And really that female bee uh, spends her entire time as an adult going out and finding food, bringing the food back to the nest, mixing pollen and nectar into a little ball, and then laying an egg and sticking that pollen nectar ball next to the egg and sealing it up in a, in a cell so that when, it's, when that egg hatches, the larva can feed on that pollen and nectar until it becomes an adult and then goes off and starts its own life. And then when, that, when the mom bee is not uh, getting food, she's in there protecting the nest from all kinds of predators that might come. And she does all that by herself. There's no, there's no worker system to help her. Uh, male bees within these solitary bees, the male bees just hang around flowers hoping to find a female to mate with. Uh, that's their only job. And then the females do the rest of the work. You can draw whatever social system uh, conclusions you want from that. There's lots of them that are fun to think about. And then uh, most bees are, are generalist in terms of they can feed on the nectar and pollen from a lot of different kinds of, of flowers. I mentioned earlier the longhorn bee, this, the one specific longhorn bee that needs sunflowers, but it can feed on a lot of different kinds of sunflowers. There are some exceptions to that, and this is one of them. This is the blue sage bee which feeds only on this blue sage plant, also known as pitcher sage or salvia. So if you don't have this one particular plant species, you won't have that bee either. And here's another photo of the same species. This is a male, but I wanted you to see this because they have just one of the most fascinating eyes in nature. Just this gorgeous blue eye that matches the flower that it feeds on, which is really nice too. So to wrap up with pollinators, basically when you think about pollinators, you need to think about diversity because Bees require a diversity of flowers. If you're a bee that lives for more than a few weeks, which most of them do, you're not gonna have one species of flower that blooms that whole time, right? Flowers come and go as the season goes. And so if you're tied to a small nest and you're a small bee that can't travel, let's say more than a hundred yards from your nest, your universe is very small. And within that universe, you have to have flowers blooming every day of the year. And not all of those flowers might be accessible to you because some of them require a long tongue or a certain size or whatever. So the more species of flowers that, that you have in the area, the more likely it is that there's always going to be something that's blooming that you have access to so you can find food to stay alive and keep your kids fed. Uh, 
On the other side of that, flowers rely on a diversity of bees and other pollinators because there are years where you know, one bee species might be uh, having a down year. Its nest got flooded out or there's a disease that wiped out that population in that local area. So most flowers have a lot of different pollinators that can pollinate them and that's important too, right? So a diversity of flowers relies on a diversity of bees and a diversity of bees relies on a diversity of flowers and that whole system together makes up a healthy prairie. Okay, changing gears. Uh, this is my clickbait advertisement for what we're gonna be talking about. So in prairies, there are three, what we call disturbances that really characterize, define, and create prairies. And those are fire, grazing, and drought. And they're interconnected, right? Uh, if you're having a drought year, you're more likely to have fires. You're more likely to have more extreme fires. And fires do a lot of things for prairies. They help keep trees out of prairies, for example. Uh, they also create really attractive food for things like bison. So a recently burned prairie is really nice and lush and green. There's a lot of protein and other nutrients in, those, in that grass. And that attracts a lot of grazers like bison or cattle or even grasshoppers, excuse me, or other animals that, that feed on the vegetation there. And so if you have a burn, that creates a more grazing. But then if you get a lot more grazing, that reduces the amount of vegetation that's there that's available to burn next time. And so for a while after a grazing event, you don't have fire. So the fire and grazing are tied together in multiple ways. Um, drought is not so much tied to grazing in terms of grazing affecting drought. But of course, if you have a drought year, that affects you know, what's available for grazers and they may have to go uh, foraging and, and further to find, to find food or they might switch up and eat something they wouldn't normally eat like for example, sunflowers that wouldn't be available uh, or interesting to them in most years, but in a drought year when sunflowers are one of the few things that are thriving, they might flip over and eat them. So anyway, there's a lot of connection between these three major disturbances that, that kind of make prairies work. And if you were in high school biology, you probably learned about ecological succession in one way or another. And that's the idea of if you take bare ground and you just sort of let it sit and nothing happens to it, there's no disturbance. Eventually that bare ground will be colonized by little weedy plants. Eventually it becomes sort of a grassland. You wait long enough, shrubs and trees will start invading that grassland and eventually it ends up at this sort of climax condition called old, old growth forest. And then if you have disturbance, if you introduce disturbance at any point, it can go backwards and it can move from a woodland back to a shrubland or a shrubland or a grassland or, by, or whatever, right? So prairies are kind of stuck in the middle of this, of this graph uh, where with fire, it keeps the trees out for the most part. And with drought, it helps keep trees out also. So those two things help it keep it as prairie. And without those two things, then it sort of would move on to be a shrubland. But there's some problems with this. This is a very linear, very simplistic model. Um, nature doesn't work in a simplistic linear way most of the time. And uh, there's a lot of unpredictability that's not really captured with an ecological succession model. So it's a good way to think about it to start out, but then uh, there's a better term for this, which is ecological resilience. And I wanna move into professor mode just for a little bit, and I promise I won't do it for long, but it's important. And you may have heard people talk about something like multiple stable states or tra state and transition models or stability regimes. These are all things that tie back to the idea of ecological resilience. And resilience is a word that gets tossed around a lot by a lot of different people and it means different things. So in an engineering context, resilience means how long does it take something to come back to what it was if you do something. If you push it, like with a pendulum, how long does it take for that pendulum to come back to exactly where it was? That's a measure of the resilience of that pendulum, okay? But with a prairie, that's a weird way to think about it because if you push a prairie with, with a drought or a fire, it might not come back to be exactly what it was before in a way that you would, rec you would not recognize any differences. That's not how prairies work because there's a lot of things that happen at the same time. And so ecological resilience in an ecological system, we talk about something called a stability domain or a regime of stability. And the, the way to think about that is a bowl and a ball. So the bowl in this case is all of the conditions that make a prairie a prairie, right? So a prairie provides a lot of different habitats for, for species that rely on prairie habitats. It provides a lot of services for species that need it, pollination, 
seed dispersal, all these things that are tied to a prairie being a prairie and being healthy. And so if you put a prairie ball in a bowl like this and you disturb it with fire, grazing, drought, that ball will move around in the bowl, right? It'll look different from year to year as it responds to those different, those different disturbances. You might walk out one year and boy, it's really tall and it really looks lush and you walk out the next year because of a drought or grazing event, it's gonna be short and kind of weedy looking, but it's still a prairie. It still supports the same species. It still provides the same essential functions. It's still doing the same thing with the soil as it was when it looked different, okay? It's still within the same stability regime. But if you push that prairie hard enough, it leaves that bowl and it goes into a different bowl and becomes something completely different. It's crossed a threshold and it's really hard to go backwards, okay? So here's an example. If you push a prairie really hard, uh, and in fact, if you turn it over with a plow and you plant soybeans in it, that is no longer in the same bowl, right? That's not a prairie. That doesn't provide the same functions, the same habitats that that, that prairie was doing before. You've crossed a threshold. And if we just stop farming and allow it to do what it wants to do, it's not going to go back to being the same kind of prairie it was. It'll turn into a weedy mess and eventually over a very long period of time, it'll recover some diversity, but it's not going to be a prairie unless we get involved and do a major restoration project. The same thing can happen with woody encroachment, right? So if you let trees grow in a prairie and you don't do anything about it with fire or uh, herbivory or chainsaws or herbicides or something, if you just let trees take over a prairie, at some point that prairie is no longer a prairie. You cross a threshold and now it's a woodland and it functions for woodland species. It, 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 the way that soil is, is built is different. Woodland soils and prairie soils are very different. They support different species and different processes. So there's a threshold that you cross and now it's a woodland. And again, it's hard to go back, right? You can't, if, at that point, if you cut the trees down, uh, it's not gonna turn back into the prairie it was before. At some point, before that threshold is crossed, you can go out and you just take out the trees and it's back to the prairie it was before. But at some point you cross the threshold and that's no longer true. Where it gets complicated is when you have a grassland that, for example, has a lot of years of chronic overgrazing and maybe some broadcast herbicide that have been sprayed on it, and you've, you've eliminated a lot of plant species from that prairie, it still kind of looks like a prairie. If you squint your eyes and look at it, it's like, yeah, that's probably still a prairie. But because you've lost so many species and so much diversity, there's, there's an associated loss of productivity and function with that, and it doesn't seem to recover. And, and so I think, based on experience, now this is not science as much as it's ex educated experience, we have managed sites like this and done everything we could as prairie managers to try to push it back in the direction of, of more diverse prairie and it just won't go. The only way we can make that happen is if we get out there and plant uh, the missing wildflower species back in the system. We, put, we reintroduce seed, we use some fire and grazing or something to help get those seeds established. We can restore it gradually to something closer to what it was, but it's, it seems to have crossed a threshold and it's different now. The reason that that's important is we have to recognize that there are thresholds and find out where those thresholds are so that we can avoid crossing them. Because once we do, we don't know how to go backwards. So as land managers, that's our job, right? Keep the ball in the bowl, uh, make that bowl as big and steep as we can by, by managing it well, uh, and make sure that we don't cross a threshold that we don't want to cross. And last on, the last thing on this topic is, I don't want to give you the idea that it's a linear process, right? That ball can go in a lot of different directions, depending on how it's pushed. It can become a crop field or it can become a woodland. There's lots of different kinds of woodlands it could become. There's lots of ways it could become degraded. A lot of potential bowls for that ball to go into. Okay, that was a little depressing. Here's the, here's the good part. We know, how to, we know how to make resilience and how to keep it. Um, so there's three keys. The first one is species diversity. We've talked about that already. The more species we have, the more roles are filled, the more redundancy is built into the system. All of that helps these systems maintain their integrity regardless of what happens. The more habitat you have, uh, the larger area you have, the more individuals can be there. So your populations are larger. They're less likely to get wiped out by one event, whether that's a disease or a storm or a fire or whatever it is that comes at the bad time. Uh, somebody's gonna survive somewhere if you have a large enough population. And a large uh, area is going to have redundancy of habitat types. So if you see this prairie, um, 
there are hills out there. You're gonna have different plants that grow on a south facing slope versus a north facing slope and different animals are gonna live there too. If you have a lot of different types of, a lot of different hills with south facing slopes, if something happens over in one area and you lose all the species on that south slope, there are other examples of that nearby and they can recolonize from that site. So large, large habitats is a second key to resilience. And the third is really similar, but it's habitat connectivity. So if we can't have large contiguous habitats, at least some kind of connectivity between smaller habitats can be important. And we can do restoration work where we have these small isolated fragments of habitat, prairies for example, we can restore some crop field areas or some other habitats in between them and reconnect them together. That rebuilds the resilience that we were missing before. Okay, so stra strategically, kind of following up on that, the best thing we can do for ecological resilience of prairies is to keep the habitat we have. You know, keep prairies from getting plowed up, keep prairies from turning into cedar, eastern red cedar woodlands, uh, maintain what we have. That's really, really important. If we can't do that, or in areas where we haven't done that, restoring habitats, at least to some extent, can make a huge difference in resilience. And this doesn't mean that we take eastern Nebraska and turn it all back to prairie. That doesn't make any sense. We need crop fields to support our society. But what we can do is we can look for opportunities where there are uh, areas where the cropland is really pretty marginal, and there's a couple of small prairies that we could connect together uh, by restoring a little bit of cropland back to prairie. Or there's a lot of work now with precision farming where we can find areas of a single crop field that are not very productive and we'd actually save money for the farmer by turning part of that field into a prairie habitat that doesn't need to get planted because every time the farmer plants money or plants seeds, they lose money. Turn that into prairie habitat and all of a sudden you've got this little stair step of uh, or, or scatter shot of little tiny prairie habitats throughout a crop field region and that can provide enough connectivity to increase resilience for at least some species. And then the last one is the prairie habitats that we have, we need to manage them for diversity. Um, and that's what I want to talk about next. So prairie management, it's interesting. Uh, I've talked to people who say, well, if nature's in good shape, it doesn't need people, right? It shouldn't need us because it can balance itself. And I disagree with that, um, especially for prairies, but also for most other habitats. But for prairies in North America, there's a really good reason to disagree with it, which is that prairies in North America, the prairies we have now have never been without people, right? So at the end of the last ice age, there were people on the continent. And as the spruce forests, as the, the oceans turned into spruce forests and the spruce forests turned into prairies, people were there and managing them. In fact, a lot of the reason we have prairies is that we had indigenous people using fire that encouraged prairies. So those, those fires in conjunction with drought are what turn prairies into prairies and it's what maintain them as prairies afterwards. And indigenous folks in, in areas of, like, of the country that are now Nebraska, they used fire to attract bison. They used fire because they liked to use fire. They used fire to open up a space to make it easier to live in or to travel through or to protect themselves from somebody else lighting a fire to, to burn out their village. They use fire all the time for a lot of different things and they were really smart about it. So they were managing prairies at that point. So these prairies that we have today have never been not managed by people. So you can't separate them from people in that way. So that's a really good precursor, okay? And with prairie management, when we think about managing prairies, there's really three things we do. We use fire, we use grazing, and we do invasive species control. I'm going to focus on the first two today because invasive species control is very different depending on whatever species it is we're dealing with. And we can talk about that if, during the question time if you'd like to. But I really want to focus on these first two. And as a goal, uh, the end goal here is ecological resilience, right? If we can maintain the resilience of these prairies, that's what we want. We're going to keep that bowl, the ball in the bowl. We're going to maintain the integrity of these sites. To do that, there's, there's sort of these two uh, cascading steps. If we can create habitat heterogeneity, which I'll explain in a minute, that creates species diversity and that species diversity sustains ecological resilience, okay? Assuming that we've got a large connected area because that's, that's of course important too. So in prairies, even though they're flat <laughs> for the most part, uh, there are a lot of different types of habitat structure. You can have tall dense vegetation that's hard to walk through. You can have areas that have been grazed really short that you can see for miles and you can see the bare ground. 
after an area has been grazed like that, you can create a really interesting habitat structure where the grasses are pretty suppressed. They're, they're, they're weakened by being grazed for a long time. But there's that, that competition from grasses goes down and that allows a lot of other plant species to flourish. And you can have these really interesting habitat types that are dominated by wildflowers. And this is a July photo and this is a tall grass prairie. And you don't see grasses out there. Uh, they're there, they're so short that they sort of are swallowed up by the wildflowers because this site was grazed really hard a year ago. A year after this, those grasses are gonna be back and they'll be really strong. But for now, this is a really different type of structure which is dominated by a lot of space below these flowers. It's more like a, like a forest uh, with bare ground underneath and except that the trees are wildflowers. And then there's some in-between sort of interesting habitats like this where you might have a light grazing uh, treatment that uh, punches some holes in, in a dense habitat. Or you might have a habitat like this where there's grazers out there that are grazing some plants but not others. And they're creating a, a variety of habitat structure where an insect, for example, or a snake that relies on thermoregulation has to regulate its temperature with sunshine. It can move from sun to shade very quickly without having to travel a long distance. Um, if it needs to feed on insects, there's a lot of insects in this kind of habitat. Uh, it's just, it's a really important habitat structure. And this habitat structure is really hard to make. You have to have uh, something to help you do it. And grazers like cattle, uh, bison do the same thing. Cattle especially, they'll get a bad rap, right? Uh, there are a lot of people who are not excited about cattle. Uh, there are climate change implications of cattle. The further east you go in, the, in prairie regions and places like Illinois and Wisconsin, they're really uh, not very happy with grazing in prairies a lot of times because there's a lot of examples of how cattle have been used in a way that have degraded prairies and destroyed prairies. But the thing with cattle is they're artists. And I call cows habitat artists because they are what can create habitats like this. How else are you gonna do that? The only way I can think of is if you take a weed whacker out in a prairie and you're really good about being careful, but try to do that on 100 acres and come back and talk to me. Cattle can do this, and all we, all we have to do to get them to do this is to adjust stocking rates and timing, and through careful management, you can create just about any habitat type that we just talked about with cattle or bison or other grazers. But cattle and bison are the best at that because they feed on grasses, and grasses are what suppress plant diversity. Something like a sheep or a goat, they're gonna first go after wildflowers or shrubs, mostly wildflowers, and that's where most of our diversity sits. So something like a goat or a sheep can actually hurt diversity much more than like a cow or a bison can. So you might ask yourself, well, Chris, why do we need all those kinds of habitats? Why is that important? Well, here's why. Because there are lots of species that have conflicting habitat requirements. So upland sandpipers are a really cool little prairie bird that relies on very short habitat structure. It likes large areas with very short grass, it makes its nest right on the ground um, and, and it doesn't like a lot of vegetation around. Henslow sparrows are the opposite of that. They like really dense vegetation, even shrubby vegetation is okay. Um, and they nest, uh, sort of hide their nest in this mass of huge vegetation where it's hard to find. They're not gonna live in the same habitat type, right? And that's not just birds. Same thing you see with grasshoppers, with all these other insect species. I could give you examples, but let's just talk about one. Bandwing grasshoppers, there's a lot of different species, tend to be in open ground. They're very well camouflaged to, to live in open ground. And they soak up that sunshine. Uh, they're very happy in hot temperatures. And they're well camouflaged for that situation. Toothpick grasshoppers are an example of a grasshopper that's really well camouflaged in vegetation. It likes to be in taller grass. It has stripes on its body that help itself hide in, in lots of vegetation, especially where there's some dead grass from last year or because it hasn't been disturbed for a few years. So these two are not compatible with each other in the same habitat type either. And the same is true for plants, right? So I mentioned earlier, grasses are sort of the big gorillas in prairies. They are the dominant force in the plant community. And so these big perennial grasses like big blue stem, if nothing happens to weaken them, they'll take over most of the, the, the space in a prairie and everything else has to sort of really fight to survive. But those grasses are suppressed by a growing season fire or by grazing or by drought, all of a sudden there's now open space in the root system and, the, and above ground for things like curly cut gumweed, which is a native annual plant, has to grow from seed and flower in the same year. It's not gonna do that if there's a lot of dense grass around. 
but when the grass is short, it can thrive and provide a lot of resources that are important for things like that butterfly that's feeding on it right there. So again, you might ask, well, Chris, what if we want all those species in the same prairie? How do we do that? Because they have these conflicting needs, right? All right, well, let me introduce you to this idea. If you haven't heard of this before, this is called the shifting mosaic of habitat patches, uh, which is just as cool as it sounds. And there's a lot of ways to do it. But the basic idea is you have a quilt work, a patchwork uh, of different habitat patches across a, a large prairie, for example, or across a landscape. And you have representation of all these different types of prairies from very, very short to very tall to just recovering from grazing to patchy. And then you, over time, you shift the location of those patches around. And what you do when you shift those locations around is that if you're a species that likes one type of vegetation structure, uh, you might live in one part of the prairie one year and then you'll live in a different part of the prairie next year. You can follow your favorite habit habitat type around and you survive just fine. If you're a plant species, you'll have good years and bad years, right? There'll be good years where you're getting exactly what you like for conditions, whether that's a lot of grazing or no grazing, for example. And then the next year it'll change and you'll have to hunker down and wait for a few years until your favorite conditions come back. But you can survive that, right? If you're an annual plant, you survive as a seed in the soil waiting for your, your favorite conditions to come back. If you're a perennial, you just sit there and you grow a little bit every year, just enough to stay alive. And when your favorite conditions come back, you shoot up a new flower and you do everything you wanna do. And we can create this sort of shifting mosaic with fences where we split a prairie up into pieces we treat each one differently every year and then we move the, those treatments around from year to year. Or we can do it with fire, where we have a large prairie, we burn a different portion of it every year and the bison or the cattle that have access to that, for example, will follow the fire and wherever we, graze, we burn most recently will get grazed really hard. And wherever it was grazed really hard last year will start recovering. You create this, this mosaic of habitat types across the landscape that looks like this from the air. And so, if I annotate that for you, bottom right is being grazed right now. It's short. The cattle that you see up in the middle by the windmill there are going to spend the entire season grazing that patch and they're going to graze it down to the ground and keep it there for the entire season. Later in the year, we open up a second pasture to them, which is the one to the left, and they, they graze that for, for the last part of the season while still grazing the first pasture. This particular system is called the open gate rotation system. It's, I'm not going to go into it, but basically you just keep opening gates through the season and you never close them. So some areas get grazed all season, some get grazed just for a little while. If you look at the top left up there where it says Forby and recovering, Forb is just another fancy word for wildflowers. That's a patch that was grazed really intensively the year before. So in the year before this picture was taken, it was short all season. And now it's just going crazy with wildflowers because the grasses are weak there's a lot of room for flowers to happen. And then the top right is an area that hasn't been grazed for several years. It's really tall and dense. So every habitat type we could ever want, if you were an animal or a plant, is represented in this one 200 acre site. And every year, those habitats sh just shift around. Areas that were grazed to get to recover, areas that haven't been grazed for a while get to gr get grazed, and everything is happy. Here's an example on the ground. So here's a prairie that was burned in the spring of this photo being taken. So this is a 2016 photo. This was burned in March. It was grazed really intensively all season. This, this July photo on a hot, dry period, you can see some of the grasses have been grazed so much and it's so dry, they've just given up for the year. They've, they're not dead. They've just stopped growing for that year. They're like, I'm done with this already. Here's the same prairie uh, one year later in its recovery phase, right? So this is, uh, it was grazed all year the previous year. It's not being grazed this year, or if it is, just very lightly. And look out there at the grasses. This is, again, tall grass prairie. This is big blue stem Indian grass. These are grasses that should be six feet tall, and they're about 10 or 12 inches tall at the most because they just came out of a year of being grazed really hard. And because those grasses are weak, look at the diversity of plants that are out there. All these flowers that are having a fantastic year. If you're a pollinator, this is heaven, right? And then right across the fence, not even a fence, right across the fire break in this case, is a prairie that is in the same prairie. The only difference here is this didn't get grazing the year before. And look how tall and, and vibrant the grasses are here. There's some of the same plant diversity so in terms of wildflowers, and there's a few different wildflowers that like this condition, but it's different than this photo, right? But they're in the same prairie. 
And then a couple of years later, this will look like the other stuff. And so everything just sort of shifts around. Okay, we're gonna move into the last piece here and this is gonna be very photo heavy and I'm gonna do it very quickly so we can get to some questions. What I wanna do is I wanna scale really closely down and talk about diversity at a small scale. Using an example that I did in 2018, I went out to Lincoln Creek Prairie, which is here in Aurora, Nebraska, where I live. And I marked out in January, one square meter of prairie. And I just put four flags in the ground. I said, okay, what I'm gonna do is for the next year, I'm gonna come here as often as I can with my camera. I'm gonna take pictures of as many things as I can in this little tiny space. And let's just see what happens. So I did that. I showed up. Uh, a whole bunch of times, in fact, 46 times. Uh, my average length of visit was about 30 minutes. It varied a lot depending on the time of year and what I was seeing. And I found in that square meter, 113 different species in a year. I was impressed with that. That included 15 plants, included 22 kinds of flies, that included 18 kinds of beetles, 14 different kinds of bees, uh, and 44 other species. Now, those are just the things I got photos of. I, my, the rules that I set for myself was I didn't get to count something if I saw it. I only got to count something if I got a really good photo of it. So I missed a lot of things, right? 113 is a minimum. And I wanted to share just a couple stories of things that I saw out there. So I talked about milkweeds earlier. This is butterfly milkweed, one of the, the really colorful milkweeds that's not pink. Um, and I had high hopes for butterfly milkweed because it's really attractive to a lot of pollinators. But for some reason during my project, this right here, this, this little bug was the only insect I ever got a photo of on butterfly milkweed in my little square meter plot. I don't know why that is. But it wasn't just that I missed them. Uh, and I saw them on lots of other butterfly milkweed nearby, just not on mine. But I know I didn't just miss them because that butterfly milkweed plant only made one pod, one seed pod at the end of the year, which means it didn't get pollinated very well. Um, but because I was a photographer and I was really interested in, in capturing everything I could, and because I love milkweed seeds as a photo subject, that one milkweed pod became very important to me. And I washed it like a hawk and it started to open one morning. I took some pictures of it starting to open and I went home thinking, okay, tomorrow I'm gonna go back and it's gonna be open. And about 2.30 in the afternoon, I said, eh, I wonder if it's open yet. And I went back again in the same day and it was open. So I'm really glad I came. And over the next day, a couple of days, I took lots of pictures of those butterfly milkweed seeds as they came out of the pod and floated around and got stuck on other things within the little pot. So that's milkweed. Stiff sunflower is another species I had high hopes for because it's a really attractive species for pollinators. We talked about it before. But if you look at this photo, you see those two little beetles? Uh, there's one on the right side and one on the left side you can just see the head of. Um, those beetles and other insects wiped out stiff sunflower flowers in my plot. So this is one that got hit by what's called a sylphium weevil. Sylphium weevils will basically cut around uh, the stem of a sunflower below the head and partially decapitate it. And then they lay their eggs in the flower head. And eventually that flower head drops off and the, the little larvae uh, will, will crawl from the flower that they've been feeding on into the ground and they, they live in the ground for a while until they become adults. It's a really cool strategy. Just, I didn't, I wasn't super excited about seeing it in my plot because I was hoping for these sunflowers to give me something else, but that was fine, it was just one. But then those little beetles showed up and these are little leaf beetles, chrysomelids, um, and they just ravaged those sunflowers. And every time a sunflower opened up, the beetles were on top of it and they turned them all into something that looked like this, which left nothing for anybody else. There was no pollen left over, no nectar left over. Um, so I got, uh, really two species of insects out of my stiff sunflower. I got the, the little weevil and I got the beetles and that was it. And I was really disappointed by that, even though it was kind of fun to watch this happen. And what saved me was the other sunflower species. So going all the way back to the beginning of the talk, right? There are multiple kinds of sunflowers. Even in this one square meter, there were two different kinds of sunflowers. And the second one is Maximilian sunflower, which blooms a little bit later after those little beetles were gone. And it was loaded with insects. So here's a photo showing three different kinds of, of insects feeding on the pollen of one sunflower blossom. Uh, there were little tiny pollinators like this little tiny wasp. There were great big pollinators like this big bumblebee, just loaded. And then there were insects that I'd never seen before that I discovered for the first time in my square meter plot. This is one of them. 
which I thought at first sight, I thought it was a, an exoskeleton of an insect that, you know, something had bolted and gotten bigger and just left this, this empty shell behind. So I started taking photos of it and then it started to walk, which really freaked me out because I thought I had just discovered a zombie insect. It turns out it's not, it's a derbid plant hopper. It's a really neat insect with these little iridescent wings on the backside of it, a tiny little thing. Um, I had seen soldier beetles around before. You've seen soldier beetles around before too, probably. They look a lot like lightning bugs, but they have these kind of brown leathery looking wings. But I didn't know there are two different kinds of soldier beetles. Uh, there's one that's earlier in the season and one that's later in the season. I learned that because I started paying attention to them in my little square meter plot. I discovered the two-striped plant hopper, which I had never seen before. It's an amazing little mimic of a leaf. And I found this little fly, which is a picture wing fly that doesn't even have a common name because it's a fly and who cares about flies, I guess. But this is Delphinia picta, which has a, ma a face like a gas mask. Um, and, it, and the males to attract females will eat rotting vegetation and then sort of regurgitate it with a little bubble below their mouth. And apparently that attracts females, which is something no one ever told me. This is a long-legged fly, which is a tiny little fly that's very colorful and also a predator. It feeds on little ants. And I had seen them around, but I didn't really know they were predators until, until I started looking closely at them. And then there were some gorgeous spiders, including this little orb weaver called the arabesque orb weaver. There were specialist insects, like this one, we've, which we talked about earlier, which is the longhorn milkweed beetle. Uh, there was a sunflower, a different sunflower than one bee, bee that we saw before. This one feeds just on sunflowers. This bee feeds only on lead plant, which is what this flower is. And they were in that little square meter plot, which is really cool. And then one of the best things about this project was the chance to slow down, really look at something and focus on it and concentrate on it. And so I got my first ever photo of a lynx spider, which I was excited about. I got my first ever photo of whatever kind of little tiny fly this is. But even better, I got to see that lynx spider catch that fly. And I was cheering on both sides, both sides, right? I didn't care who won. It was just really fun to watch it. And in this case, the spider won. Um, I tried to get a photo of this little jumping spider, but he was too quick for me. Uh, but a couple days later, I saw it again. And I got the picture, which I was very excited about. And then that spider, had a little ant that came crawling by. And sure enough, I got to watch him catch the ant. Uh, and that was exciting. And I got these, I got all these little natural history stories that you see on TV with things like, you know, lions and wildebeests or lions and, and, and antelope. I got to see the same sort of action within a little square meter of prairie through my camera lens, which was really fun. I got to see praying mantises, which are some of the most charismatic uh, insects around because they can turn their head. It looks like they're always looking at you because they have those little pupils in their eyes, but the pupils are actually pseudo pupils. They're a trick of the light. Don't, they're not actually following you with a pupil. They have compound eyes. It doesn't work that way, but it sure looks like they are. And they're just so charismatic. Even they're, they're great photo subjects, no matter what they're doing. And my favorite day, the best day of the whole project was the day I saw a tree frog because I had never photographed a tree frog before. So the first photograph I ever got of a tree frog happened in this little square meter plot and it wouldn't have happened except that I was staring at the same little space and I saw movement. It's like, oh boy, look at that. And I photographed the heck out of that little, little cute tree frog from every angle I could manage. So to wrap that up, um, I've been, I've been, Dakota talked about earlier, I've been with the Nature Conservancy 23 years. I've been studying prairies for longer than that. I know prairies pretty well. Uh, and I thought that I was really good at observing prairies up close, both through photography and through science. But that one year of studying that little tiny plot over and over and over and over taught me way more than I ever thought it would. And it inspired me in a way that I didn't think possible to look at prairies differently. Not just the diversity of prairies and not just the complexity of prairies, but the, the, the beauty of the stories that happen in every prairie everywhere at that little tiny scale that most of us miss because you just walk past them or drive past the prairie without walking in. And if you don't get down close and look, you don't see a lot of those things. So just to let you know, uh, I made a book out of that project, which is just, has just come out in the last couple months. So if you're interested in that, if you wanna learn more about prairies, get excited about prairies, help others get excited about prairies, you can get the book. If you wanna learn more of the details of the management and all that, uh, I wrote a book several years ago about the ecology and management of prairies. And then on a more recurring basis, I write a blog called The Prairie Ecologist that you can follow. And I talk about all of that 
I talk about photos and prairies and management and natural history and all those sorts of things. Um, and then you can learn more about the Nature Conservancy at our website. I'm going to stop talking. Dakota, do we have any questions? <laughs> yes, we do. Thank you for all of that. Oh my gosh, those photos are beautiful. Where can you get the book? Uh, anywhere. Anywhere? Uh, cool. You can order it online. Hopefully by the time uh, bookstores are open, they'll have it. Uh, most nature centers, when they get open, should have it. But yeah, anywhere you can find books, you should be able to find it. Awesome. And, and just to be clear, I don't profit off the book. Uh, I wrote it as a member, or as a staff person of the Nature Conservancy. So if you buy the book, uh, the royalties go to the Nature Conservancy. Awesome. That sounds beautiful. Wow. Thank you for all of that. That's incredible. I can't believe it's already been almost an hour. Um, <laughs> all right. First question. What wildflowers with long roots would be good to plant on a steep hill to prevent erosion? Okay, uh, that's a good question, and it, there are a lot of good options. Um, just about any species that is a perennial that lives in a prairie will work for that, uh, depending on the habitat type, right? So what you want to do is you want to find out what your soil type is. Is it sandy? Is it clay? Is it lust? Is it silty? Um, do a little research for prairie plants on that soil type, and you can do that research either by doing, going online or just talking to somebody at a nursery that knows what they're talking about. But it's going to be site specific, right? So something that does well, uh, and if it's in full sun or shade, that matters. But just about any perennial plant that's a prairie plant is going to do the job. Cool, sweet. Um, let's see. You have, we're getting some praise from Mark Welsh. Um, he was oh, thanks, saying Mark. that he's loved your pictures and stories about them for several years, and so he says thank you. Um, we have a woman that has gray milkweed north of Omaha. Excellent. Another question is, what is the favorite milkweed for monarch butterflies? Uh, so across most of the state, it's either going to be common milkweed, which is sort of an eastern plant, or it's going to be showy milkweed, which is in central or western. Those are the, the two that we see the most caterpillars on. So in that way, I guess it's the favorite. but uh, you know, swamp milkweed is really popular with them, and that, that is a little bit more wet habitat species. We have that one in our yard, uh, and, and it's very popular. But again, like I said earlier, really any milkweed species will work, as long as it's a native milkweed species, uh, mm -hmm. it'll be good. But if common and showy are the most um, attractive, it seems like, to monarchs. But the issue with some of those is things like common milkweed, it spreads like crazy in your yard, right? It has these rhizomes, these underground stems and it'll spread out into your yard it'll spread into different parts of your garden and if you're okay with that fantastic but if you're not that's where something like a swamp milkweed really works well because it's also very attractive and it stays in one place mm. hmm. interesting um how harmful is it to native bees for there to be honeybee colonies and hives near or in native prairies it's a good question and it's hard to know uh the more we learn about it the more we see conflicts so there, there is some competition there, right? Honeybees are really good at their job. Honeybees are very organized. They get out early in the morning. They can work in cooler conditions than a lot of our native bees can. And there are some situations where it seems like they can get out there and sort of clean out all the resources before the native bees get there. On the other hand, there are a lot of species of plants that, that can't be pollinated or can't be accessed by honeybees. So honeybees don't have the right tongue length or the right size or whatever to do what they, what they need to do to get some. That said, there's enough competition that, like with the Nature Conservancy, we don't allow honeybee hives to be put on our properties uh, because we don't. We feel like why take the risk of adding that competition to a bunch of bees that are already kind of struggling. Um, mm -hmm. But we do see honeybees. I mean, we, our neighbors, some of our native, native neighbors have honeybee hives, and so we see honeybees on our site, and it seems to all work out. The big key with bees, no matter what, is habitat. If you have enough habitat meaning enough size of the habitat and enough diversity of flowers, the competition is meaningless because there's enough for everybody. So it's only when resources get tight that that competition starts to be important. That makes sense. That is pretty universal, it seems. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Amanda's wondering, what is the name of the toxin in the latex of the milkweed? Oh, boy, that's a good question. Is it glycoside? Like, um, 
I don't know. I'd have to look it up. I'm sure you can find it before I can. <laughs> it's the same latex, but by the way, it's the same kind of latex that are in rubber plants, uh, in mm -hmm. lettuce plants. It's, it's all latex, and there are a lot of different species that make it, but it's the same latex that we get rubber out of. Hmm. Weird. Um, Aaron's wondering if climate continues to be more variable and extreme, will some specialists or pollinators become extinct, and how will that ripple through the system? Yeah, that's definitely something we're, we're watching closely. Um, it's interesting, so far, my experience at least, and this is not necessarily true universally, but my experience watching bees that specialize on a certain flower and watching those flowers open earlier and earlier every year, right? Or even in years like 2012. 2012 was so crazy. It was hot and dry, but it also was early, right? Everything was blooming a month or more early a lot of times. And in fact, we had some fall blooming flowers that bloomed in the spring for some reason. Even in that year, things like the blue sage bee uh, seemed to be in sync with the species that they were, that they were specializing on. Um, I didn't know the lead plant bee that I know now. I didn't get the chance to see that. But I'm fairly optimistic that those bees and flowers are going to adapt together. But I know that that's not universally true. There are, there are research projects going on right now where people are trying to figure that out. And, and to your question about the, the ripple effect, I mean, with a specialist bee like that, it's not, it's, it's mostly going to be important for that species of bee, not for the plant so much, because for the most part, those plants have multiple options. There are all kinds of things that can pollinate them, not just those specialists. So the specialist bee is the one that will suffer the most. And then the ripple effect from that will be more things like, uh, are there parasite species that rely on that kind of bee, or are there... Uh, a wasp, for example, that, that its larvae feed on that kind of bee and that that bee disappears, that wasp might have a hard time. But it's really hard to predict that because honestly, we just don't know all those different connections yet because insects are really hard to study, especially when they live below the ground. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, Carol, I know we went over this, but Carol's wondering um, if you have any more specific steps that are necessary to return farmed ground to prairie or reintroduce native grasses and wildflowers? Yeah, sure. It's, it is, there's a lot to it. Um, there's actually a really good resource. If you go to prairienebraska.org, uh, it's a website we set up years ago. So prairienebraska.org, there's, there's a, a, pat, a piece on the, on, the, on, the, on the right side of that, there's a little window that says like downloadable guides. And one of those downloadable guides is a restoration guide that was put together by Prairie Plains Research Institute. The Nature Conservancy was a little involved with it, but it's a really nice guide for exactly step-by-step -step how to do it. So that's one thing. Uh, but really briefly, the key points are you want to use as many species as you can. You want to use native plant species, you know, that are native to the area. So if you're buying those species instead of harvesting them, you've got to really ask a lot of questions of people you're buying the seed from. Where did the seed come from? Where was it harvested? Is it harvested in Nebraska uh, or someplace else? And you want to try as much as you can to find seed that was harvested in Nebraska. Um, and then the key is to make sure that whatever was growing there before is gone, right? Mm -hmm. Because crop field is fairly easy because really what's, what's going to be in the seed bank is a lot of annual weeds and your prairie plants will be able to, to outcompete most of those without much help. But if it was a bluegrass yard or if it was some other kind of perennial vegetation, you need to spend several years probably spraying that, that vegetation with herbicide or tilling it up or both most likely uh, and really getting rid of that and then start with a clean slate and plant your seeds. Mm. Um, that competition is the toughest thing the first couple of years. If it's just annuals, you'll probably be okay. If it's perennials, it can be a lot trickier. So I, I, can't, I can't give you all the keys right now just because it's its, it's, its own pr presentation. So again, if you can find that Prairie Nebraska site and find that guide, it's a, it's a really easy to understand and nice little uh, restoration guide. Okay, awesome. And I did post that in the chat. So oh, great. if you didn't catch that, it is there. Thank um, you. Yeah, of course. Holly is wondering, how do you use fire safely in a windy area that is small, like four acres or less? Yep. Uh, yeah, it is tricky in small areas. Um, the basic idea of most of the fires that we do is we use fire against itself. And what I mean by that is we'll, we'll mow usually uh, around the edges of our site. And we usually make like a 20 foot or wider fire break by mowing out all the vegetation, raking out whatever's there, 
getting it down to very short grass where the fire doesn't burn very well. And then we can use water to put it out very quickly if it gets into that area. And then we'll start on the downwind side of the prairie that we want to burn, right? And we light it in the taller vegetation. The wind is trying to blow it into the short vegetation. But once it gets in the short vegetation, it's really easy to put out with water. And it'll, but it'll back into the taller vegetation. So it backs into the wind and starts to create a bigger area of black. And the more area of black you have, the better, because that's going to be important in a minute. And then we work up the sides of the prairie, lighting into the wind, and that creates a little bit more black. When we get to the far end, we come together and we light on the windy end, and the wind pushes that fire across the entire site until it hits the black on the other side and basically puts itself out. So that's the quintessential sort of ring fire technique. It's not the only way to do it, but it's a very safe way to do it. And it works even in a small prairie. Um, but in a real small prairie, you could basically burn the whole thing just by letting that fire back up into the wind, which keeps it very low and in control and lower temperatures. And as long as you can make, reach your objectives with that, and by, and by that I mean like if you're trying to kill trees, a low backing fire that's back into the wind will kill small trees. It's not going to kill bigger trees. Um, but as long as what you're doing is, you know, going to work, if you're just trying to get rid of the extra fat that's there or kill off small trees, you could just do that. You could just let it back up the whole time, which makes it a lot easier to control. Hmm. But the, the key is to make sure that you have a plan. You know, you're looking at what the weather's going to be. You're watching the weather during the fire to make sure the forecast isn't changing or the conditions aren't changing. You've got lots of people and lots of water and lots of people who know what they're doing. It's not something you would go out and just do with a garden hose for fun uh, without a lot of practice. <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> Playing with fire. <laughs> yep. Yeah, um, a, that's the same, right? Yeah, right. Uh, Mark is wanting to bring up a possible opportunity. He says, have you talked to the landowners along the Platte River starting next to I-80? east of the Mahoney State Park about cutting or burning all of the eastern red cedar trees <laughs> that look like they have totally taken over the bluffs above and along the river. Does that go on forever to where the Platte joins the Missouri River? Yeah, it, that area has really changed, hasn't it? I mean, I remember in high school driving between Lincoln and Omaha and, and, and seeing prairie on those hills. You could see grassland and black-eyed Susans and, you know, I didn't even really know what prairie was, but I recognized that it was something there. Uh, and you don't see any of that now. Um, man, that's such a hard thing because it's really, really expensive now that those trees have gotten big and there's not a lot of economic return, right? So it's not going to be something where the landowner there is necessarily going to make a lot of money by having fewer trees. In fact, we're still in a place where a lot of people see that as increasing the property value, uh, which is not at all true from a habitat standpoint, but the people have that idea. And until that changes, until there's some sort of economic incentive in terms of land values of getting rid of those invasive trees, I don't think it's going to change. Um, so we could we could chip away at it. We could work with one property owner or another. But if we don't do it all, if we don't do a large enough block, those cedars just spread right back in and you haven't really gained anything. And mm -hmm. unless those landowners are willing to commit to regular use of fire, once the big trees are gone, using fire continuously uh, to keep those prairies open again, I just don't see how it's going to happen, which is not to mean, not to say that we shouldn't do it, right? We shouldn't, it's not that we shouldn't try but it's a huge challenge. And I'm pretty sure those sites have crossed the threshold, right? They're not in the same bowl anymore. So even if we got rid of those trees, there's gonna be a lot of restoration work needed if we're gonna get any kind of prairie diversity back on those hills again. Mm -hmm. So I'd love to see it happen. Uh, I don't know where the money's gonna come from or what the incentive is for people to do it on their own. It's, gonna, it's just a tricky problem. Mm -hmm. Dang. So the key is, here's, here's what's important is, there are a lot of parts of the state that haven't gotten to that point yet. And those are where, those are the places I think we should be pouring resources, right? There mm -hmm. are a lot of prairie habitats that are just starting to get invaded by cedars. It's not far enough along that it's hard to catch. That's where we need to pour, put our resources. Now, we can go back and work in the Mahoney area anytime, right? It's never gonna get a lot worse than it is now. But let's save the areas that haven't gotten to that point before they cross that threshold. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Someone is wondering if there's a minimum area, like in number of acres, in which you can successfully rotate conditions, fire, and grazing. Yeah, that's a tough question because it, there's no right answer to it. Um, I've seen patch burn grazing, which is the idea of you know burning a piece of the prairie every year and having cows out there everywhere and they just follow the fire. 
I've seen that work on 20 acres at a time, 30 acres at a time. So these are pretty small areas where you maybe burn, you know, five or 10 acres a year. Um, and that's okay, and that works all right. The, the issue is, you know, the smaller the prairie you get, the more, especially with cattle, the more kind of sacrifice areas, the larger percentage of the site is gonna be like the, the area they stomp down around the windmill, right? Or the area that they, they go lay down in near, near some trees or when it's hot, where do they go? And all of a sudden, you know, 25 or 30% of your area is those little areas, which on a 100 acre prairie, you're nothing, you're a tiny little percentage. On a small prairie, you know, you can't really afford to maybe give up 20% of your prairie to that kind of heavy regular disturbance. So it's a little trickier that way. The cost of water and fence, um, you know, might not get paid for by the income you get from the grazing. That's another challenge. So there's a lot of answers to that. I would say if you have a site that's in that 20 to 30 acre area um, and you can get the logistics figured out in terms of infrastructure, grazing, you know, fence, water, that sort of thing, and you've got access to cattle, you can do some really great habitat management with cattle. I would say if you're less than 10 acres, um, you probably were gonna be looking at other options. And not, not necessarily, you can do it with cows, it just gets trickier, but you can do things like, maybe instead of grazing, you use haying and fire, and you try to hay it at different times of the year in different places, and you hay it at different heights, so you're not always mowing it low, sometimes you mow it a little higher or a little lower. You can still create a shifting mosaic of habitat structure it might not be as extreme, you know, from very short to very tall. You might not get the recovery patches that you would get from grazing, but you can still create a lot of different kinds of habitats and move it around and do some good things. Very cool. Um, is it true that some prairie plants need to stay viable for 100 years or more? Um, I think the blowout pipe stem is one of them. Blowout penstemon, I think, is what she's, she or he yeah. is saying. Um, yeah. Yes, um, staying viable is a tricky thing because you could that could either mean the plant itself living that long, which is definitely true. There are a lot of perennial prairie plants that can live that long or longer. Um, and then the other option is like the seeds, right? The seeds staying, staying in the soil and that varies a lot by species. There are some that, you know, people have found seeds that are thousands of years old and they've gotten them to germinate. Um, I don't know that we have prairie species that can do that, but it wouldn't shock me. I don't think anybody's tested it with prairie species. But there are definitely species that are in the seed bank for a very long time. Now, the flip side of that is, if you really look at the seed bank in a prairie, if you, if you went out to a prairie and you sprayed a big patch with Roundup, right, and you just killed everything that was there, and then let's, let's say, let's just rely on whatever's in the seed bank is gonna grow now, and now we'll just get a new prairie because all those things have seeds in the soil. That doesn't work. Um, what's mostly in the soil are annual plants because that's how they have to survive, right? They are built to grow from seed to flower in one year. And so they spread their seeds out and they're ready at any opportunity to do that. Most perennial plants are a very tiny piece of the seed bank. So if you did that spraying treatment and then watched what happened, what you would notice is that 99% of the plants that are growing back are gonna be annuals and kind of weedy things. Good, but weedy. And you're gonna, you're, you're gonna have a lot of species that are never gonna show up with that treatment. So while they can be long lived, most perennial plants don't really rely on seeds as their major way to reproduce. They're re reproducing by buds underground that make new shoots or by rhizomes that are underground stems that form new shoots. They have other strategies besides just seeds. Seeds are a way to move to a new area, not so much to survive over time. Hmm. Awesome. Um, there's another question. Can you convert tall grass prairie in the official Nebraska tall grass prairie region into short grass prairie? Yeah, yeah interesting. Um, you can to some extent, but it's always going to want to go back to tall grass prairie. Um, you know, the plant species that are there uh, are adapted for the higher amount of rainfall that you're going to get in eastern Nebraska. Um, if you were going to do it, what you would have to do is you'd have to do something like regular intensive grazing or regular mowing to prevent things like big blue stem in Indian grass from taking advantage of the fact that they're really good at monopolizing a large amount of water. And you want to keep those species weak so that the, the species like uh, blue grama or buffalo grass, things that don't compete well with the big guys, um, but can do well in low moisture conditions will still be able to grow because otherwise they're going to get swamped out. 
And even if you don't, even if you took an area and you, all you planted there were short grass prairie species, there's still going to be that tension, right? There's always going to be things trying to come in from the edges. And if they get any kind of established, they're going to have a big advantage because they're better suited for the moisture conditions that we have in eastern Nebraska. Uh, so I'm not telling you shouldn't do it, but it's probably more of an educational thing where you do it, you'd want to do it on a small scale where you can really control it and try to really uh, put some pressure on the things that want to grow that are not the short grass prairie species that you want. Cool. Um, here's a good question. What are your thoughts of using the floristic quality assessment in measuring restoration and management versus say a more intuitive strategy or both slash all strategies of measuring success? Yeah. Um, so the floristic quality assessment idea for anybody who doesn't know, it's how do I explain this quickly? The, the basic idea is you take every plant species and you give it a rating from zero to 10. Okay, so every plant has its own number. A plant that is a zero would be something like an annual sunflower that can grow just about anywhere there's some bare ground, doesn't have to be in a prairie. Um, it'll survive and it'll grow and do its thing. A 10 would be something like the prairie fringed orchid, which is tied to prairies. It can only grow in prairie habitats, it can only grow in prairie habitats that are really well intact, that have been well managed, that are in good shape, um, that have sort of everything going for them. And then you've got species in the middle that can, you know, go, go both directions. And then the floristic quality assessment is you take, you go out to a prairie and you look at all the species that are there, you count them, and then you do another calculation that takes into account both the number of species and the rating that each of those species have. So it's sort of like a qualified plant diversity measure. Uh, and, this, and it's a way to evaluate a prairie. And you can do that with one number for the prairie, or you can do it a lot of times and then average them together, which is what I do a lot. Both of them can be helpful and they can be really good ways to look at things. But you're right, uh, question answer, that it, it takes a lot of work, it takes a lot of expertise because you have to know all those species and it's not the only way to evaluate a prairie. Um, what I would say is on the opposite end of the scale but also helpful is a, an idea that was coined by a rancher in Kansas uh, named Wayne Kopp. Uh, and what he said is the three best, the three things that are important about prairies are color, movement, and noise. And that if you have a prairie with color, movement, and noise, it's probably doing okay. And if you sort of think about that and, and you apply it as you go around a prairie, I think, I think it's true. Um, the trick, of course, is there are some plant species that even though they're colorful uh, and full of pollinators can be invasive and they can start forming monocultures. So the real key is you want a prairie that is going to maintain its diversity. You don't want any species to gain an advantage to the point where it starts to become too dominant and force others out. And any way you want to measure that is okay. Uh, and you don't have to know all your plant species in order to evaluate a prairie. Wow, good answer. <laughs> um, Jen's wondering if you think that the monarch species will be listed as, listed as endangered. Uh, I don't know. Um, here's my personal answer, and this is just me. This is not the Nature Concerns, not anybody else, just me. I hope not. I hope, I hope not, and, I, and, I, and not because I hope it recovers, because I definitely hope it recovers. I don't think listing it as an endangered species is going to be productive. I don't think it's going to help. I think it's going to polarize discussions around habitat that we can have uh, in a much more productive way now without, without listing it. Uh, but I don't know what the Fish and Wildlife Service is going to do with that. It's, I, I think you can definitely make a case to list it. Uh, insects have a hard time, though, uh, in those decisions. It's rare that insects get listed uh, for a variety of reasons, a lot of them political, a lot of them scientific. So if I was going to guess, I would guess it's not. And, and again, very just me personally, I hope that's true. I would rather have discussions about prairie habitats and milkweed and pollinator habitat without having that polarizing sort of icon of the monarch hanging over people's heads and, and people trying to bash each other over the head with monarch butterflies. But that's just my opinion. Yeah, good point. That does happen. Things get divisive and, and things are a little more extreme. Um, this is a more specific question from Lynn. She's saying that she has a 70 acre pasture in Wayne County, Nebraska, divided into four paddocks. We move cattle to a new spot after the graze went completely but closed the gates. Where can I find research about the open gate idea you discussed? Uh, the easiest way is to go to my blog 
which is there at the bottom of the screen, and just type in the search box, just type in open gate, uh, or just do a Google search for open gate grazing rotation or open gate rotation, and you should find it. I wrote a, I wrote a couple of pieces about it, one that describes it, kind of how we run it, and then another couple that mention it as, as I talk about management. Um, and if you try it, I would love to hear from you uh, and, and hear what you think of it, because it's something that we're sort of just experimenting with. I've been using it on my own prairie uh, that has four paddocks uh, here in Hamilton County for about 10 years, and I really like it. Uh, I use the same stocking rate I was using before, um, and I just, whenever the cows look like they're running out of grass, I open up the next gate. And I always have one pasture that they don't graze at all every year. And that's the one that got grazed like the hardest the year before. And man, the habitat looks great. There's lots of butterflies, there's lots of flowers. Um, so yeah, I, I, I think it's worth trying. I'd love to hear how it works for you if you decide to go that direction. And oh, also, and it's, it's, not a, it's not a rigorous system, right? There's no right way to do it. You can, you can just play with it. If you, could, if you have your regular rotation system that you like, you can just play with when you move cattle from one pasture to the next, maybe leave the gate open for a while and see what happens. Mm. If, if you don't like what happens, close the gate, you know, and then the next time you do it, try the same thing. And you can, you can just make it work for you the way that you, it works with your own site. Yeah. Relative to that, Holly's wondering how many cows to graze four acres in timing. To graze four acres? Mm -hmm. And in what part of the state do we know? She didn't say. Okay. I mean, that matters a lot. Um, four acres is pretty small. If you're in eastern Nebraska, that might keep one cow happy. Um, if you're in western Nebraska, it won't keep even one cow happy. So you probably don't want a cow in there all season unless you're going to supplement it with something else. And even if you're doing that, it's going to look like a lot of horse pastures look probably, where it's going to be pretty short all the time. So if you've got four acres, what I would suggest is if you can do it, use grazing where you Maybe you graze, um, you know, two thirds of the site for three months, one year, and then you rest it all the next year. And the next year after that, you come in and you graze another two thirds that overlaps a little bit, and you graze it for a different three months, and then you rest it for the next year. You do something like that where you still get that disturbance, you sort of shift it around, but I don't think you'd want to graze it every year um, because I think you'd, you'd start to see some overgrazing impacts at that point. Hmm. But and maybe one cow. Maybe one cow. If you're in South <laughs> Nebraska, you've got a lot of rain. It might work with one cow. She did say eastern tall grass here. Yeah, I just okay. found. Yeah, so you might get by with one. I wouldn't go more than one or two for sure, uh, at least when you're starting out. Mm. Um, let's see. During your prairie year, Kim is wondering, did you also see birds or mammals in your plot? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I did. I just didn't get any photos. Actually, I never did see a bird. I, and I know they were there. They had to be there because there were sunflower seeds that disappeared out of those Maximilian sunflowers in a way that I, like the, the plant wasn't bent down like a mouse had climbed up. There was no pile of seeds at the bottom like a mouse had gotten it. I'm pretty sure the birds were landing in there and taking them. I just never saw it happen. Mm. Uh, mammal wise, I saw the tail end of a bowl disappearing into a tunnel a couple of times. There was a tunnel right through the plot. So I know there was a bowl going back and forth. I never got a picture of it. And then there was a little juvenile cottontail rabbit that hung out right on the edge of the plot a lot of mornings, but again, no matter how much, how careful I was sneaking up, I could never get a picture of it. So <laughs> there were some, I just never got them. Sneaky. They, they didn't count my 113. <laughs> um, Uden Cindy is saying, loved your presentation. Is there a native drought tolerant grass that would work well in our yards? Drought tolerant grass? Uh, yeah, there are quite a few of them. Um, it depends on what you're looking for, right? If you're, if you're looking for something really tall that's going to grow tall and then sort of lay over potentially, you know, big blue stem Indian grass, switchgrass, all those will work. I like some of the little bunch grasses a lot better for like a garden setting. So when we landscape around our house, I use things like side oats grandma or June grass. Um, sand love grass actually works really well, even if you're not in sandy soil. Sand love grass is a really pretty little bunch grass that has nice seed heads. Um, did I say little blue stem? That's another one. Prairie drop seed in eastern Nebraska is really pretty and kind of a bunch grass. Mm -hmm. And those are nice because you can, they're, they're, they're not going to spread quickly except by seed. They might spread by seed. Um, and then, you know, if they're getting too tall, if they get, if you have one year where they get too tall and they start to flop over the next year as they're growing, 
just chop them a couple times, right? Clip them off the ground, about eight inches off the ground a couple times in June, and then let them bloom after that. And they'll stay shorter and more kind of well-behaved. Um, and yeah, all, any, any native grass that's from a prairie is gonna be pretty drought tolerant. So you have a lot of choices. Did not know that, thank you. Um, connecting to that, where can you order wild sour, wildflower seeds in Nebraska? There's a lot of options. Like I said, the, the tricky thing is if you want seeds that were actually from Nebraska plants, your, your selection gets more limited. Um, there are a couple of real small companies that have started up in, the, in recent years that I think are great, um, who are really trying to cater to that restoration uh, sort of aspect or, or, or effort. So one of those is called Prairie Legacy. Um, which is by Western Nebraska, which is the town Western, not the, the part of the state, but Western Nebraska, just, just Southwest of Lincoln. Uh, there's another one called Shoestring, Shoestring Acre Seeds, which is up by Albion, Norfolk area. So that kind of covers Southeast and Northeast Nebraska pretty well. Um, apart from that, you know, uh, Star Seed and down in Kansas does some harvesting in Nebraska. Um, and then there's, there's things like Stock Seed and Arrow Seed that my understanding is most of their wildflower seeds are grown out of state, like they have nurseries that they buy seed from. So you're, you're, you might get a native species, but it has a different genotype, which, you know, if you're doing something for your yard or in some, some different aspects, there's nothing wrong with that necessarily. Um, but, if, but if you have the option to buy Nebraska seeds, I like to do that mostly because uh, we know we're not going to bring in genotypes from a different area. Um, and also because it's kind of fun to support people who are trying to do, you know, local Nebraska work. But I'm not mm -hmm. advocating against any of those other companies too. I just say if, if you talk to them, ask questions and make sure you get what you want. Mm. Otherwise, they'll probably give you what they have. Uh, and if that's okay with you, great. But if there's something you want, you'll probably have to ask some hard questions and make sure they're listening to you. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Donna's also wondering, is it best to plant seeds or plants for enhancing a prairie? Both can work. Um, if you're going to do a small area and you want fast results, plants are easier. Uh, they're more expensive. Uh, if you've got a larger area and you've got time and you're willing to do some weeding, and I mean you're going to have to pull weeds either way. But if you're if you're willing to wait a little while and have some weediness for a couple of years potentially, then seeds are a lot cheaper and you can do a lot more area for the cost. And you can combine the two, right? You can use some plants so that you get some things fast. Um, with a seed mix, you can make sure you have some annual plants in there that are going to bloom your first year and then kind of give way probably to some perennials that come later. So there's not a right or wrong answer. Um, the big thing is if you're, if you're establishing a new prairie, even if it's like a little prairie garden in your backyard, don't expect not to have to fight weeds because you will. You'll have to fight mm -hmm. weeds forever. It's not a no maintenance situation. It'll use less water than a lot of other flower gardens. Uh, I don't ever water my flower garden, my prairie gardens in my in my yard, um, but I'm pulling weeds out there a lot. Mm. Well, talking about um, certain plants taking over, Ryan said that he planted a pollinator patch seed mix in November 2019 in a 400 square feet part of my backyard. Um, let's see, I don't think I'm going to pronounce these right, but the lance leaf cori. Coriopsis. Yes, yep. thank you. Black eyed Susan and partridge pea are dominating. The milkweed, pale and purple coneflower, bergamot, and cardinal flower have not yet appeared. Should I be concerned? Nope, not yet. Too early to worry. Um, what's, what's happening is exactly what should happen, right? You've got these pioneering species, these opportunistic species like black eyed Susan uh, and the Coriopsis. That's what they're built for. They're built to come in quickly when there's not a lot of competition. Those other species you mentioned uh, are going to take a few years to get to the point where they can bloom. So they're probably there. They're probably very small. Or maybe they haven't germinated yet, but they probably have. Um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't panic on any of those until at least three or four years in and then, and then see what you have. And then if there are species that are missing, um, you know, maybe that's when you buy a couple of plants and plug them in as, as seedlings and really baby them until they get big. Mm. But at this point, no, I think if you've got that, if you've got what you described, it sounds like it's working just right. Hmm. Cool. Kathy's wondering if showy milkweed is the same habitat or needs the same habitat as common milkweed? They can share the same habitat in central Nebraska, 
The further west you go, it turns into just showy, and the further east you go, it turns into just common. So they sort of intermix in the, like around where I'm at here in Aurora, uh, Grand Island, Kearney, that area, you get both species. But if you're east of Aurora, you're more Lincoln Omaha, it's probably gonna be common. And if you're out in like the North Platte area, it's probably gonna be more showy. Although you can have some common that'll go further west, but showy becomes more abundant for further west you go. Mm. Um, she's also wondering if you could recommend resources for consulting and creating and restoring prairie for very small acreages. Small acreages. Um, yes. So those two seed companies I mentioned, Prairie Legacy and Shoestring Acres, are good resources to talk about that. They sell the seeds and they'll help you make sure that it works also. Uh, I think Prairie Legacy actually does some restoration service where they'll do the full service for you. Um, there's another group, Prairie Plains Resource Institute. Prairie Plains is a, is a, a nonprofit organization here in Nebraska. They do restoration work, large scale, small scale. Uh, they're using, you know, species mixes of 100 species of plants or more. They're very diverse. And they've done, they, they, you know, they're the ones that started restoration work for the most part in Nebraska using those high diversity mixes. So they know what they're doing. Um, and in that restoration guide I mentioned earlier, if you want to try to do it yourself, that guide that's on the Prairie Nebraska site uh, will kind of just lay it out. Like, here's everything you need to know for how to do it. And it won't be cheap. Don't, don't expect it to be, you know, $10 an acre. It'll be a couple hundred dollars an acre or more, maybe $500 an acre if you want to do a real high diversity mix. Um, whether you're buying the seed or paying somebody to do it, it's going to be a little pricey. But it's worth it because it'll last longer. Remember that more diversity is more resilient. Mm -hmm. So once you get it established, uh, it's going to be pretty stable and it should really work out well. Yeah. Mm. Um, there's one question about the stinking Japanese beetles. Um, yeah. Does spring seven, does spring seven for Japanese beetles hurt bees? Yes, it can. Yep. Uh, I mean, seven kills a lot of insects. And so if you're desperate, it can be okay, uh, maybe that's the way to do it, but there's no real good answer for Japanese beetles right now other than, you know, killing the individual beetles. Uh, and so, you know, knocking them off into a bucket of soapy water is a great way to do it. If you're up to it, just smash them between your hands. Um, yeah, they're a pain. Uh, it, it, it's interesting to watch them in prairies because we didn't really know how they were gonna impact prairies. And they have their favorite plants in prairies too. At this point, I'm not too worried. I don't think they're gonna take out any particular species in prairies. Uh, they're really hard on lead plant flowers. That's the one I worry about the most. Everything else, they mostly eat the leaves or they eat some flowers, but not all of them. But I know a couple of prairies where the lead plant just hasn't been able to produce seed for several years now. That, that might be a concern, but they, those plants live a long time. So there's a lot of choices or chances. Mm. But yeah, any, any kind of pesticide, um, you know, the less you spray, the more targeted you are about it, the, the less other impacts you can have for sure. Um, but none of them are going to have no impact. You know, they'll, mm. so I, I'm not telling you not to do it, just do it as little as possible and be specific about where you're aiming it. Okay, this is a longer one. Cody okay. said, thank you for this amazing talk. I was really interested in the part of the talk when you were speaking about how indigenous knowledge played a big part in our understanding of how fire can be helpful in grassland management. Is there anything in your work or the work of others that you know of that's trying to include these indigenous voices in research? And if there is, how has this influenced conservation? Um, yeah, that's an awesome question. Here's, here's the quick first answer. It's not happening enough. There's mm -hmm. not enough of that out there. Um, I think that we have learned a lot from indigenous cultures about how fire works, especially fire and bison on a large scale. Uh, I don't know that those conversations are happening uh, continually now as much as they should be. There are some people like Kelly Kincher down in Kansas who has done a lot of work um, studying indigenous cultures, studying the way they use plants, uh, the way they interact with the land and writing about that. And Kelly has been a great resource for me. I've learned a lot from him. Um, there are some, some things going on with some tribes uh, in northern Nebraska, the Dakotas, Montana maybe, with bison, where we're trying to, we're trying to work as a large group to protect um, 
some of the remaining bison that we think might not have cattle genetics in them. That's a whole other topic. Mm -hmm. Most of the bison we have today were saved by ranchers when they're on all the bison were just about gone. There were a couple of ranchers that rounded up what they could and they saved them. But one of the reasons they wanted to save them was they wanted to try to breed them with cattle and mm -hmm. see if they could, you know, find advantages from a livestock perspective. And so a lot of the genetics of the bison we have today, we know that there are cattle genes in there. That's not necessarily the end of the world. They still act like bison. They're still bison. But there are a couple of strains of bison that we don't think have cattle genes or we haven't found cattle genes in yet. And so we're trying to make sure that those populations grow over time, right? And there's a partnership that's grown up between the Nature Conservancy, uh, the Turner, Ted Turner's organization, uh, several tribes and some other people that work in bison where we're trying to work together and trade those animals back and forth and, and increase those herd sizes. And the indigenous groups have gotten more involved lately. The tribes have said, hey, we want to be involved in this. And so we're trying to work out ways where we can trade animals back and forth. So there's, there's that kind of conversation. But um, I'll just be really honest, it's not happening like it should. It's not. And, that's, and I take responsibility just as much as anybody else for not seeing that happen. Um, so I, I, I'm really glad you asked the question. It's something we're talking about more and more and we're looking for opportunities to get better at that. Mm, good, awesome. Oh, mushroom fungi question. Uh, what role does fungi or cryptobiotic soil crust play in so or prairie integrity? The cryptobiotic part is interesting. Um, I don't know a lot about that because I think it's most important in really dry soil. This is what I, knew, I do think I know about it. And there's a lot of misinformation out there as well as a lot of science. And so you have to be really careful. Um, there are people like Alan Savory who will tell you he knows how to, how to fix prairies by lots and lots of cows in a small area. And the science says that he's not right. He's just wrong. He had a TED talk where he talked about a lot of that stuff and he got people very excited. And if you dig into the research, he's just flat wrong on most of that. Um, so there's that. Um, but fungi and bacteria are incredibly important. And, and there are a lot of plant species that have a very tight relationship with a particular fungi or a particular bacterial species or multiple species where those fungi or bacteria are attached to the roots of that plant and they help that plant get the resources out of the soil that it needs. It's a symbiotic relationship. And if you don't have all those parts, something it doesn't work right, yeah? But it's also one of those things where there's a lot of people who are trying to sell uh, ranchers or prairie folks on these these like inoculants like you need if your prairie is going to be healthy you need to have a certain ratio of bacterial and, and fungi and if you don't have that here's a product we'll sell you you can dump this on your prairie and it'll increase your bacteria count or whatever and a lot of that to be honest is still snake oil science it's not really good because we don't understand it well enough to know what we need um, what I when I talk to soil scientists when I talk to people who study below ground systems from an ecological standpoint, what I hear more than anything else is, if you can manage for habitat heterogeneity and plant diversity, those below ground systems are gonna take care of themselves for the most part, as far as we know, as far as we understand now. It's not that it's impossible to get them out of balance, but that idea of even getting them out of balance is crazy because we don't know what it is, what imbalance looks like necessarily. And again, especially coming out of crop field systems, there are a lot of people who are really interested in soil health and talking about what soil health means. But soil health in a cropland system does not necessarily translate well into a grassland system. Um, we just don't know enough about it in a prairie. And it's so complex and it's so different from soil type to soil type, from moisture area to moisture area. Um, grazing systems are not consistent in the way that they have reactions from soils. It's just too complicated. And so at this point, Managing for a resilient system based on what we know makes a resilient system is the way to handle it, I think. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, going back to grazing again, um, Hannah's wondering, she said, you mentioned cattle are an alternative to using bison as grazers. Do cattle also have similar benefits to tall grass prairie seed dispersal as bison? Seed dispersal? Um, probably less for seed dispersal because they don't have the same fuzzy coats. But I would say in most situations these days, we're not relying on bison to move seeds around the landscape, right? Most of our prairies are small enough that we don't need bison to carry seeds long distances. And even when they did that in the old days, you know, you think about the chance of success for one seed. Um, it's, ex 
extraordinarily high that it's the, that it's not going to work, right? A seed. I mean, you think about the life of a seed that falls off and, and lands or flies through the air or lands on an animal and gets carried. So a lot of things have to happen, right? First, it has to it has to drop in a place where the soil type is right, where the community is not so competitive that it can't grow, and then it has to land on bare soil somehow and find bare soil, which is really hard to find in a lot of prairies. Um, and then when it lands in that bare soil, it has to have something happen to, to bump back the competition so that there's enough moisture to grow, enough sunlight to grow. And just, I mean, the proportion of seeds that, that actually turn into a plant is incredibly small. So I don't worry too much about, getting back to your question, I'm to, I don't worry too much about the seed dispersal mechanism of bison. What I, what I do worry about is more the sort of the way that they manage prairie competition between plants or manage habitat structure. And in those ways, cattle and bison are really similar. There are some differences. There are some behavioral differences where, for example, bison don't stand around in the water uh, and they don't congregate in around the water or shade like cattle do. And so there's some management implications that are important and different there. Um, but with cattle, because we have like on our sites, we bring in other people's cattle and then they take them back in the, in the winter. I don't have to take care of those cattle all year round. We're on the sites where we have bison with the Nature Conservancy. We own those bison, we manage them all year round. We have to take care of them, we have to doctor them, we have to do all these other things. It's not something that works in every place. It works really well on, you know, a 10,000 acre pasture. It's not great for a 100 acre pasture. So there's places for both and, and both species can work really well for us. That's a really long answer, I'm sorry. <laughs> No worries. Great. Um, Mark is saying that the common milkweeds in their backyard have fallen over. His wife is worried that the monarch butterflies won't visit them because of that. The top ends, though, are now growing up again. Is that a common way for milkweeds to grow, to fall over, and then have the ends shoot up again? It can, yeah. I, I, I think the monarchs will find them either way. I don't think you have to worry about that. It's more aesthetics. And really what you're seeing is you're seeing in a situation where there's those monarch or those butterflies, the milkweed plants have so much nutrient, so much moisture, they don't know what to do with it. They're not, they don't have to compete for anything. And so they get everything that's there in the soil, they get it and they grow so quickly that they just can't support their own weight. It's like, you know, they're just too greedy for their own good in a way. Um, so there's a couple of ways you could manage that. One would be, uh, you know, put some other plants nearby, give them some competition. They can survive competition. They're not gonna get outgrown by other things. Uh, look at look at them in road ditches that never get mowed, right? They're still doing well. So don't have to worry about crowding them out. Mm. And that'll help them keep more of a, of a reasonable size and growth, growth rate. And then the other thing you could do is when they start to grow, before they start to flower, you know, cut the, cut the top half of them off and make them regrow. And that'll, that'll delay the flowering a little bit, which isn't really hurting anything. But it also, it, it takes away some of those resources and makes them sort of grow smaller than they would otherwise do. Mm. So, but it's just an aesthetic issue. It's not hurting anything ecologically. It's just going to look weird. Yeah, yeah. Um, he's also wondering <laughs> where people can see pictures of your home yard. Many people want to copy <laughs> what you use and have done. <laughs> yeah, I've posted some things on my blog about that a few times. Um, I would guess if you go to the blog and you type in something like Prairie Garden, uh, you'll get three or four or five stories uh, that I've written and, and you'll be able to see photos of my of my yard there. Mm. And I'll just tell you, my yard is a mixture of, I've got some areas of bluegrass because I have kids that want to play soccer. I've got areas that are completely prairie species. I've got prairies that are vegetable garden. And I have areas that um, are a mixture of native and non-native wildflowers, all of which are good for pollinators. Um, and our gar I, what I tell people all the time on this is you want to, uh, your yard should make you happy. Mm. So do things in your yard that make you happy. Uh, you can do great, great things for pollinators and, and still not be an exclusively native plant garden. And I know that sounds like heresy coming from me probably, uh, <laughs> but it's okay, right? I mean, use native plants, use, use plants that are not bred so that they don't have anthers and produce pollen that's accessible to pollinators for sure. But that doesn't mean you have to use all native plants. I have zinnias in our yard. My wife loves zinnias and I've, I've come around to really like zinnias. They're gorgeous and they're loaded with butterflies and bees. Um, so you don't have to go native only, but you sure can too. There's nothing wrong with doing it that way. And there's some really cool things about saying, hey, my entire garden is, is native. That's awesome. Just don't feel like that's the only way to do it. Mm -hmm. 
Um, there's a question about how deep in the soil do prairie plants and grasses send roots? <laughs> this is something we're learning a lot about. Um, so there's two, there's two answers to that question. The first answer is there are prairie roots that can be, you know, 10, 12, 15 feet deep. And a lot of native grasses in this, in the eastern part of the state have roots that are seven, eight, 10 feet deep at least. But the second answer to that is we've learned in the last decade or so that they're not using those roots the way we thought. Um, the assumption has always been that those deep roots are why prairie plants do so well in drought, right? That when, in the drought, when it's a drought year or several years of drought in the top area, the soil sort of the zone kind of dries out. They just, they keep going down and they can pull moisture from very deep in the soil. As it happens, when you really start looking at that, they're not doing that. Their grasses uh, get almost all their moisture from the top 10 or 12 inches of the soil, almost exclusively. Uh, and even during drought years, they're not really pulling moisture from down deep. And, and, that, and why they're not, I don't, I don't know. They've got roots there, but they're not using them for that. So they seem to be maybe using those roots as a place to store carbohydrates where they can get those carbohydrates deep down in the soil out of the zone of things that are going to eat them, for example, like pocket gophers or invertebrates or nematodes, things that are going to eat those carbohydrate reserves, they can store them down deeper and make them safe. And that makes some sense. But man, as long as the roots are there, why wouldn't you pull moisture through them? We don't know. Um, but the, the typical way that it works in a prairie, even during a drought, is the top 10 to 15 inches maybe is dominated by grasses. The top, the next sort of foot, foot and a half is dominated by wildflowers and everything below that is mostly shrubs that are getting the, that moisture. Mm -hmm. So in a drought year, when the top area zone, top zone dries out, uh, those plants are surviving because they have ways to live on less water, not because they're necessarily getting deeper, deeper water, mm -hmm. which is really crazy and interesting and we're still learning a lot about it, but it's, it's a very different story than I would have told you 10 years ago. Mm. Wow, it's amazing what we're learning just in the past few decades, right? Technology makes it a lot easier. They can, they can put yeah. probes in the ground and watch where, how moisture levels change during droughts and what zone the water is being pulled out of. It's, it's really cool. Crazy. Wow. Christina um, says that she has 20 acres of farmland in Dodge County that wasn't producing much that I've recently converted to pollinator strip. My county assessor is unwilling to reduce my property values. Are there any programs that she should be aware of? Uh, yeah, this is why it's important to vote. Um, I, don't, I don't know of anything that's going to necessarily help you. Uh, and I hate to say that, but I'm, I'm fighting the same thing. Uh, I mean, so with the Nature Conservancy, we see this, you know, we, we pay property taxes. And when we take cropland and we put it back to prairie, we're still paying the same taxes we were paying on that cropland. Because the way the assessors look at that is, it's, it's still cropland. Just because you choose not to, you know, use it to its full potential, in quotes, uh, it's not our fault. You know, we still want the same amount of money. Um, my personal prairie, the family, the, the prairie that our family owns, my grandpa put the majority of that back into grassland back in the early 1960s. I still pay property taxes as, as, as if it was cropland. Um, so that's a, that's a law change that needs to happen. That's a, that's a policy issue. Uh, I don't know of any programs. You know, there are some cases where a conservation easement that prevents it from ever being put back to cropland can have an implication, but there's no, there's nothing that says the assessor has to take that into account and change your taxes. So I, yeah, there, there's some there's some rumors going around. There's some discussion going on right now as everybody's trying to figure out property tax reform. There is some discussion that maybe there's there are ways to do what other states have done and give people incentives for doing conservation practice by giving them reduced property tax rates. But what you have to remember is those property taxes are what pay for schools and county road systems and all those sorts of things. And the counties are not going to let that go easily. And so unless there's another source of income that makes up for that, uh, I, I don't see it changing anytime soon. So mm -hmm. that's frustrating. I'm, I'm with you. I'm right there with you. I just don't know how to fix it. Mm -hmm. um, interesting. Um, Amanda says, what does the nature or does the nature conservancy have access to short grass prairies in Nebraska? Are they open to the public to visit? If so, uh, we do have some shorter prairies out in the panhandle. Uh, none of them. Well, I shouldn't say none of them. Uh, we have one up in Sioux County, 
uh, by Harrison that it's not open to the public. It's, it's, a, it's run like a ranch. The rancher that, that is managing that for us is fantastic but it's not really set up for public access. It's too remote. We don't have bathroom facilities. There's nothing, there's safety issues. We can't do it right now. I would love to have more events out there so that people have a chance to see it. It's called the Cherry Ranch. You can look it up and see photos of it. Um, if I have my way, we'll start having at least one, maybe two public events out there a year. We were gonna do that in June this year and that didn't work for some reason. Um, and then there's another one called the Murphy Ranch, which is part of a system of prairies that's owned and managed by Preby, Platte River Basin Environment. It's, it's in the Wildcat Hills area. Um, and if you go to the Nature Center there at the Wildcat Hills by Gehring, um, they can give you a map of all these public access areas. And some of that includes land that the Nature Conservancy owns. Um, that's what we have for short grass. You know, the Sand Hills, uh, which is not really short grass, but you can go up to our Niobrara Valley Preserve and we have a big hiking trail that you can take and hike through some shorter prairie up above the Niobrara River and see the valley and it's a really pretty hike. But if you really want short grass prairie in Nebraska, I mean, the Ogallala National Grasslands is a huge landscape of public access areas. Uh, you could start at a place like Toadstool Park and hike from there um, on, a, on a gorgeous hike to Hudson Main site and back. Uh, there's a lot of public land in the West that's short grass if you, if you go looking for it. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. And then, and then Colorado, it. Wyoming have a whole lot more than we ah, have. Yeah. Yes. Luckies. <laughs> yes. Um, Ron says, I put a pivot corner into CRP pollinator habitat in south central Nebraska about five years ago. He has two or three plant species that are dominating the habitat. What is a good way to get the habitat back to being more diverse? Yeah, um, you've got some options, but you're limited by CRP rules, right? So you have to make sure that, and I don't know all those rules enough to tell you exactly what you can and can't do. Um, the, if, if, if the rules weren't there, my advice would be what you want to do is you want to, whatever the dominant species are, and I'm going to assume they're probably grasses and maybe a couple of big sunflowers or big forbs like that. What you want to do is right when those plants are about to bloom or just starting to bloom, you want to mow it, you know, or burn it or something at that point in the season, because that means that those plants that are dominant just spent all the energy they had, they could get to make flowers and start producing seed. And you took all that energy away from them and they wasted it and they've got to start over. And that's going to weaken them enough that you'll have some other species that'll have a chance to come in. Um, the same thing applies with getting those species short so that you get more light hitting the ground so that seeds can germinate. Um, and get rid of the thatch that's out there with a fire of some kind so that it doesn't shade the ground. Anything you do to disturb that site is going to be good. The maximum benefit will come if you can do it at the time of year when those plants are about, about, about ready to bloom. So, but you'll have to work with the NRCS or FSA folks and say, okay, what are the rules here? What, what, what can I do? What can't I do? How many years in a row can I do it? Or how many years out of 10 can I do it? And just sort of negotiate from there. But they should be on your side, right? They're going to they're want the same you want it's just a matter of working together with them to figure out what rules are going to allow. And it can be mm. true. Mm. Good to stick by those. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You don't want to lose your, all the money that you put into it or that you got out of it. Good They'll take your not. payments away if you do it wrong. So, yeah, <laughs> All right. Last question. Are you ready? Okay. Last one. <laughs> all right. Mark says um, he's wondering if you have seen a change in the prairie you manage caused by climate change. He's been told invasive plants are moving into western and central Nebraska ranches, which I think are mostly native prairie. Yeah, so first, before I answer the question, uh, there are still, looks like 53 people on this. This is amazing. Thank you for sticking around. Uh, it makes me feel good that people care about prairies uh, and that you're interested. So thank you for doing that. Um, in terms of Mark's question, climate change in prairies. Um, there's two things here. The first one is I'm pretty optimistic in general with prairies and climate change because prairies are naturally resilient. If we can manage them and make sure that they maintain that, res that diversity and we manage for habitat heterogeneity, they've withstood already some amazing climate change things, uh, both in recent years and even like going back into the 1930s, right? They had uh, an immense drought uh, period during the Dust Bowl and those prairies came out of that looking really different than they did coming in. And then five years later, they looked just like they had in general beforehand. 
We lost, we didn't have extinctions. Uh, their prairies recovered their diversity and resilience really well after the Dust Bowl. And so not that that's a perfect parallel of what we're gonna be going through or what we are going through now, but it, it's, it's, it's data, it's information that makes me feel better. Okay, so that's the one thing. The second thing, yes, Mark's right. There are invasive species that are, that are coming in that are becoming more aggressive. They're acting differently because the system is changing. The, the, the growing conditions, the enabling conditions for some of those invasive species have gotten better for those species. They're favored more than they used to be. That's, that's gonna be especially things like deciduous shrubs, um, vines like poison ivy, but others, others like that. Um, uh, what are some examples? Uh, cool season grasses, smooth brome, Kentucky bluegrass tend to do better in droughts and in, and in hotter, drier conditions. Uh, it's, it's complicated, but there's reasons that they do. The other thing that's happening right now is not just warming and drying, but the other factor is nitrogen. Um, we have nitrogen deposition in Nebraska, which is basically nitrogen falling out of the air and, and fertilizing the land. And that nitrogen comes from livestock uh, areas. It comes from industrial sites. And, and there's a lot of different sources around. And the closer you are to those sources, the more nitrogen you're getting. But even far away from those areas, I think there's something like 10. Uh, Dave Wardeen at UNL is the one who figured this all out for me. Um, I think he said something like 10 pounds of nitrogen a year fall out of the sky. And so these sites are being fertilized. Now, that's, that might sound like a good thing, right? And it is for some species, but it also helps tip that balance in a way that's not necessarily productive. And one of the thing, one of the groups of species that really likes that high nitrogen are those cool season grasses like smooth brome and Kentucky bluegrass, which are important invasive species that form monocultures and fight against diversity. So not only are we seeing climate change, but we're also seeing this fertilization in a way that favors some of the species that are going to hurt us in the long term in terms of diversity. So. What all that means is, really, we just have to be very thoughtful as managers um, to watch for signs that some species are becoming more dominant, you know, be creative in the way that we combat that with management techniques, and just be vigilant. Um, and we may get to a point where there are some prairies that it's like, there's just no way to keep this from being taken over by shrubs. We just can't, you know. And then at that point, the discussion becomes very interesting because it's like, okay, how do we manage this as a shrubland now for diversity and resilience and ecological function? Because it ain't just, it just, it just ain't gonna be a prairie anymore, right? And I don't wanna get to that point and I'm gonna try really hard not to get to that point, but there are places in Kansas and Oklahoma where that has happened and it's not really reversible in any easy way. Uh, and we're looking at that and there's a line of that shrub invasion that seems to be moving northward uh, so we may get to that point at some point, at least on some sites. So that's, yeah, there's some really interesting philosophical discussions we could get into another time uh, mm -hmm. about what we're going to do about that. But for now, I really feel pretty optimistic about a lot of our sites, especially the big ones that, that don't have, you know, a small prairie with a ring of trees around it, uh, where there's no way to get a, away from that invasion of trees. Mm -hmm. Those bigger sites, I think, have a good chance of survival, if we're smart. Yes, we need to be smart and creative, strategic. Strategic, resilient. <laughs> yes, yes, well, awesome. My gosh, thank you so much, Chris. This has been incredible. Thank thanks you very for much. Just... Yeah, again, thanks for everybody coming. This it's really a, uh, makes me feel optimistic for that reason too, so thank you. Mm, yeah, same. Thank you, everyone. I hope you enjoy this beautifully hot Saturday <laughs> afternoon. Thanks so much for being here, you guys. We will have the recording posted on the Facebook event page as well as Conservation Nebraska website. So that will be there. All right. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Chris. See you guys. Bye, everybody.